Um, I think now if we could come to um, the time when you left the Handling Squadron and went on to, you, you were mentioning your interview, we didn't quite complete it, your interview with Lord Brabazon for the job at the ARV. Well, you could finish that. Yeah, it was, it was pretty searching really. But when it became clear that I'd spent the whole of my um, flight test life up to that point on handling qualities, it was clear that they were very impressed by that. And a few days later, um, I was offered the appointment, which I took. And that was in August 1949. And I joined ARB knowing very little about the operation and work of civil aircraft, but understanding that the job was chief test pilot to the authority. Not too many people know or knew of ARB or what it did, but it was, and the CAA now is, the certification authority for the UK government in terms of civil transport aeroplanes. And that's aeroplanes of all weights, from the tiniest little hang glider up to Concorde and 747 and whatever. So I joined the board in uh, 49. There was one other test pilot. There were only two or three aerodynamicists and flight test engineers. But from that point on, it all slowly started to come together. And if one goes back to 1949, the aeroplanes then flying were the last of the piston engine aeroplanes, which was the Ambassador and the Hermes 4, and the first of the prop jets, which was the Viscount primarily, followed soon after by the Apollo. But of course the, the Apollo didn't develop and it was uh, the Viscount which uh, got all the work done, and later the Britannia. So from that point onwards, Jeff Howitt and I flew every single major prototype that required UK certification. They were nearly all British built in those days, but after a while French aeroplanes came in, Italian aeroplanes came in, and of course um, eventually American aeroplanes. So that was, uh, that was the task initially, and this work went on, in my case, for 30 years, and in that time, the simplest thing is to say that I flew everything there was to fly. Except at the end, when the work got very demanding, although I flew the DC-10 and the Lockheed 1011, I didn't do the bulk of the work. I delegated that to other people. And even now, the only aeroplanes I haven't flown are the Airbus series and the 757 and the 767. Can you... Um pick out some of these aircraft, perhaps starting with the with the Ambassador, and um, detail a few of your impressions of them. Well, <clears throat> most of them made their way through certification without too much sweat. The Ambassador flew very well. It had all sorts of good qualities. It had immaculate storm qualities. It was stable apart from two small problems early in its life. When George Miles was chief designer, it did exhibit two things which I didn't like. The ailerons overbalanced in a side slip, which of course is simply not acceptable because it makes the aeroplane laterally unstable, and the elevator overbalanced at high incidence on the weight of the stall. All the usual arguments developed. Did it really matter? And my response was always the same. I didn't write the airworthiness requirements. They were written by industry, of which George Miles was a member, and they were there to be observed because they dictated minimum standards. So they had to fix the ailerons, which they did reasonably quickly. But when it came to the elevator, it was a bit of a bigger problem. I remember George Miles coming up to see Hardingham, took us all out to lunch, big pressure on Hardingham to keep Davis quiet and certificate the aircraft. Well, of course, it wasn't on. You cannot have aeroplanes with self-stalling tendencies. And just to complete my defense, for my case, I even read the military requirements, AP 970, of that period, which would be 1950 or 1951. And they forbade self-stalling aeroplanes. 
So I was able to go back to the boss and George Miles and say that it simply was not on and that if my boss wanted to certificate the aeroplane, he could do it himself, but without my blessing. And of course, he, he, he couldn't possibly do that. So the elevator was turned down. Great forecast then. You've put the aeroplane back six months. It's going to cost a million quid. And of course, it was all rubbish. I, I've heard these arguments so frequently. About eight weeks later, I was asked to go back to Christchurch and fly the aeroplane with a new elevator, which was great. It was perfect, and it worked perfectly well. Now, the other big piston engine aeroplane that we produced was the Hermes 4, which eventually went into service on the African routes. And the only thing you can say about the Hermes 4 is that it flew like the fourth bridge. It was terribly heavy, terribly heavy. But it had no feature that you could actually turn down, apart from the fact that if you did a lot of training on it, like engine out takeoffs and landings, it whacked you out. That aside, however, it met all the requirements. But it was designed for four Centaurus, but the drag of the airframe was rather high, and the aeroplane never got off, got onto the step, as it were. It used to cruise with the tail down a bit, and, and the fuel consumption and the air miles per gallon were all sad facts. It never did as much as it should. This was a civil, uh, civil development of the, the Hastings? Right? Yes, it was. Yeah. And it had a nose wheel, and it worked. But when I say it was heavy, even the nose wheel steering loads to taxi around the perimeter track nearly killed your left arm when you were steering it. You had to put all your strength in it to get it going around the corner. But they were hydraulically assisted, weren't they? Yes, they were, but there wasn't enough puff in the hydraulics. The, the simplest way to go around the corner was to give it a dab of brake. That would start it going round, and then you could follow it with a nose wheel. Whereas the idea of a nose wheel is to lead with a nose wheel, not follow. I remember one lovely day at Boscombe Down, we went down to do all the engine out work, engine out takeoffs, engine out go rounds, engine out landings. And after three circuits, I was physically exhausted. And I said to Hazel, look, I can't do any more, I've got to have a rest. He said, that's okay. He said, I'm amazed you did three. He said, I can usually only do two. And Hazel was a big, big chap. Fella, yeah. 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 So we parked the aeroplane got out, lay on the grass for an hour, and then when I was refreshed, we got back in and we finished the programme. But what was this uh, heaviness in the controls due to? I mean, were the cables badly run or what? No, it was simply that the primary flying controls were not sufficiently aerodynamically balanced. Because if you take the balance too far, you can get overbalanced. And old Handy Page was a terribly conservative chap. And although he was no longer chief designer, he kept a very close eye on when, what went on. And the alien loads on the Hermes 4 were enormous. You had to take a deep breath, get onto the wheel and go, pow. The elevator loads, particularly for landing, ah, gosh, you, you can't imagine. You had to pull 70 or 80 pounds to flare for a landing. And the rudder loads, they were right up to the airworthiness limit, which is 180 pounds. And, of course, in an engine-out condition, you had to hold those loads for quite some time. It was exhausting. But what you, about, you had trimmers though, you had rudder trim and things like yes, that. You, yes, but it wouldn't take it all out. Not, not that size of load. And of course they were a bit low geared. If you wound a lot of trim on to help yourself in an engine out landing, either you or the co-pilot had to wind it off again in a rush for the landing when you were down on the ground. Now you see, you can beef about heavy control loads on an aeroplane, but if they are within the requirements, you have to buy them. If you then say, well, it's, it still isn't much of an aeroplane, to some degree it doesn't matter, because airline pilots with a bunch of passengers on board don't do engine out circuits and landing. The worst they will suffer is one engine failure on, on any given flight. And then if they can trim it out and come down gently and land and put it away, that's okay. But that was the fact of those aeroplanes. You didn't have anything to do with the Tudor, presumably, that was before your time? No, before my time, yes. Mm. So that was the Hermes. What was the next one? I feel like saying, you name it, that was it. The Viscount? The Viscount. We flew the prototype, which was a little 630. There were only three fuselages made. One was a test specimen. One was the prototype. The other went to Bolton Paul as a test fuselage for that the then Tay engine and electric link signaling, which maybe we'll come to later.
But the Viscount 630 was a sweet little aircraft. It was very small, nothing like the production aeroplanes. The production aeroplane was the 700. It flew well. It had one big problem, which was the stall. Now, in common with all propeller aeroplanes of that period, the stall was very asymmetric. As you came up, the machine would tend to roll. If you acted very quickly, you could keep it more or less straight, and then it would pitch down. But if you did a power on the stall, you had to work with the speed of light to keep it under control. And uh, the machine would roll a long way. Now, the requirements were reasonably accommodating for an aeroplane of that type. And the angle of roll should not exceed 60 degrees in a power on stall. Well, if you worked hard and fast, you could contain it within that. But every now and again, you got a bad stall and it rolled a lot further. And some years later, on production testing, one of my pilots actually spun a Viscount on a power on stall. The gear was down, the flaps were down, he was doing a power on turning flight stall, and the machine didn't muck about, it just spun. It did about six turns, which you know you're not supposed to do in a big civil aeroplane, with engines stuck out on the wing. But he cor they corrected it, they got it going straight, but in a moment it spun the other way, which is what happens if you hang on to the spin recovery action half a second too long, it'll go around the other way. So, and he went round, he did another two or three turns the other way. Now, in the meantime, they put, they had the wit to pull the flaps up to save them breaking off. But the gear was still down, but that's okay. Gears are quite strong, really. And when they finally recovered, about 2,000 feet above the water out at Hearn, because they'd gone in at about 15,000 feet, they just flew it gently back and put it on the ground, made a flapless landing. And when they looked at it, the fin had actually started to fail and if it had done one more turn the fin would have come off but you see I had exactly the same experience on the Britannia 100 when I was doing the Brit down at Filton Bill Pegg did some flying with me but he was uncomfortable in the right seat it wasn't his scene he hated being mucked about by some other pilot so Walter Gibb did some work with me but he didn't like it either, so in the end, they gave me one of their junior pilots, a bloke called Godfrey Orty, the guy who eventually flew that 180, 188. the 188. Well, Godfrey was quite happy to sit there. He, he was fairly junior in those days. He just sat there and put the gear up and down and the flaps up and down and that sort of thing. And we were doing the stalling program on the Brit at about 14,000 feet. And I wasn't looking forward to it. I knew it was going to be grisly because turning flight power on stalls on those big aeroplanes where the flow across the wing all the propellers go the same way remember the flow goes like that it's not a good symmetric flow and some of the straight stalls were a bit ugly and when we came to the turning flight stalls I was a bit nervous and in the one to the right which I never liked because if you fly in the left seat and you do a stall to the right you can't see the ground or the water Whereas if you do them to the left, you can see the ground or the water, and it's visually stabilizing. But you must do them to the left and the right. So I was doing this one to the right, and I got to the point where it was about to stall, and I chickened out. I recovered, and I thought, poof, I don't like this. Nobody said a word on the flight deck. We just cleaned it up, and I steamed along, and then I thought, well, okay, we'll do it again. So we put the gear and flap down, went in again. I got to the same point again. And I was frightened, and I thought, no, bugger it. So I put the stick forward, and we sailed along. And then I thought, and to be fair, no one on the flight deck said a word. And I thought, well, what am I up here for? This is what I'm paid to do, go and stall the stupid aeroplane. So we put it all down again, came round the corner, and I got to the same point. And I thought, I've been here twice before in the last quarter of an hour. I might just want to stall it. I gave it, in my opinion, one thou of up elevator. That's all I did. Uh, you see, and at this point, I had nearly full left rudder anyway to keep the turn going, a good bit of wheel on, and then I gave it one thou of up elevator. And the machine immediately, I can show you with my hand, it turned right over, like that, right round, the nose falling, and it settled into a spin. And this was a Brit, which was a big elevator. Are you saying you inverted it? Oh, yes, it went right, it did a flick roll, and while, so you're doing an inverted spin? 
No, it right. settled up into an erect spin. See, if you watch now, there was the aeroplane. Mm. It rolled like that. The nose went down, yeah. and it finished up in a, in a classic spin. Mm. And I could remember saying, Christ, it's spinning. Nothing, and there it was. It was doing, it was about 45 degrees now, nose down, and going round dead steady once per second, or maybe once every two seconds. I saw the engineer's great hairy arm come up and close the throttles, which helped a bit. And I said to Godfrey, pull the flaps up. So he selected the flaps up. And then I said to myself, spin, recovery action, opposite rudder, stick forward. I applied opposite rudder, stick forward. And it stopped spinning in half a turn. But it left me very steeply nose down. And I was now down. We went in at 14,000. I was now probably at about 10 or 9. But because I was so steep nose down, I could see every wave on the Bristol Channel. You know, so clearly you couldn't believe it. So, but the machine was now in a steep dive. It had finished spinning, it was in a steep dive. I started to pull the stick back and I could see that I would make the recovery. There was no question, we weren't going to hit the water. We would come round the corner nicely. So instead of pulling an awful lot of G and, and maybe putting a lot of stress on it, we just pulled gently and we came round the corner. And we actually came out at about 3,000 feet, having gone in at 14. And this isn't a fighter I'm talking about. This is a bloody great civil transport aeroplane. And again, there was silence on the flight deck. So I said, look, we better go back and get the aeroplane checked. Leave the gear down, leave the flaps up. And then I had a flight test engineer called Roy Burdett. And he lit a cigarette. I smoked in those days. He lit a cigarette for me. And as he handed it over, he said, now how about a loop as an encore? <laughs> <laughs> And when I got back, we landed the aeroplane and Russell and Bill Strachan came up. And Russell said, I hear you've had a problem. I said, yes, we have. I said, we spun the aeroplane. And I was pretty cross. You see, it, the machine could have folded. The fin could have come off anything. And Russell said, well, what are you upset about? He said, you recovered, didn't you? And I said, listen, Russ, that's not fair. I said, what did you find when you saw the aeroplane? And he said, ah, now, he said, we've got a problem there. He said, I'll get Walter Gibb to talk to you. So I pushed off and had lunch and thing. I came back and Gibb came up and he said, i got a big apology to make to you. I said, what's that? He said, we have, we've never done any power on stores. And I said, well, for goodness sake, I said, you guys are supposed to explore your aeroplane completely. Tell me that you think it's the world's best aeroplane. And then I'm supposed to come and do a few checks to either to agree or disagree with you. And he said, well, all that, he said, got left out of the program. And he said, the best thing you can do is push off and come back in a couple of weeks when, we, when we've done it all again. So somebody did it. I never knew who did the program. I expect it was Gibb. And they came back, and then I came back, and Russell said, look, it's like all these big airplanes. He said, you've got to be jolly quick when it stalls. You've got to apply opposite on a full wheel, stick out forward. And he said, you'll just save it. He said, you had bad luck. He said, you must have been like one-tenth of a second slow in doing what you should have done. I said, great, now you tell me. Anyway, we went up. And of course, a month later, I was back up in the same point, doing it all again. And the, I was watching the horizon like a hawk. And the moment it stalled, and you talk about the speed at which you react as a test pilot, it's counted in portions of tenths of a second, you know. I had full left rudder, full wheel, stick forward, and I held it at about 60 degrees of bank and recovered. And then, of course, I had to do several more. It's no good doing one and saying, that's good enough, chaps. So I had to do a lot more. But that was the truth of it. If you acted with the speed of light, you could show compliance. But, I mean, could it have gone into service with that problem? I mean, did you have to... Oh, yes, it could have, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Because they lost one Britannia, didn't they? Didn't Bill Pe Pegg have to set it down on the, on the swamp? Ah, they, they, they lost two. They lost two. Bill Pegg was flying RX, I remember the registration, mm. and he had KLM on board, and they were doing a demonstration. Half, and they were up over the Welsh mountains. Halfway through this flight, one of the engineers came up and he said, we've got a problem on number four. The oil temperature's going up. So Bill said, we'll shut it down. So they shut it down and fed the prop. Because remember, on that funny aeroplane, you could run the engine with the prop feathered or unfeathered. 
or you could run the prop with the engine stopped. They, they were not connected, not mechanically. They were only connected by gases. Um, so they shut it down. Russell was on board. All the KLM knobs were on board. And as they came back to Fulton, Bill Pegg didn't want to do an engine out landing. And with all respect to dear old Bill, I believe he was nervous of it. I don't think he'd ever done one. He, but he said he didn't want to do an engine out landing and demonstrate to KLM that they'd lost an engine, you see. So he said to the blokes something he never should have said. He said, fire it up again. Now, you must never start up an engine that you've shut down for good reason. They fired it up. It immediately burst into flame. And it burned and it burned and it burned. Bill then, and they couldn't put it out, Bill then felt he was losing lateral control. And he was quite close to Fulton, but he didn't think he'd make it. So they put it down in the mud. Do you remember? On the side of the river. And it, the, the tide was out, the mud was very soft, and it went in deep. Nobody was killed, but Russ and KLM and everybody else had to scramble out through the mud into the local brickworks. Now that was one. The other one was a guy called Hugh Statham was flying another Brit on an autopilot runaway program with the future RAF pilots with him because the RAF were buying the cargo version, the 253. And they rejoined the circuit at Fulton. They were 1,500 feet downwind and for no reason which has ever been explained, the machine rolled over and went straight into the ground. And that prang has never been explained to any degree. It is believed that it was an autopilot roll runaway because it is the simplest explanation that appears to fit the facts. But I doubt that. Could they have been on autopilot at that part? They, they could have been. But you can always ditch an autopilot. Yeah. Unless you had a coincident failure in the system by which you ditched it. In which case, your fertile imagination would then imagine that you could perhaps have an accident like that. Anyway, that was mm. the Brit. Yeah. You see? But, sorry, sorry. Can, have you been well, the other aeroplane with four big props was the Argosy, which I did a lot of work on, awful lot of work, and yet it never did much. They only sold 10 to BEA and 10 to some American operator. But that had the same thing. That had a wonky stall. And the poor old Argosy, it wasn't much of an aeroplane anyway. If you make a specific dedicated cargo carrier, it has a big fat fuselage, which is very insensitive over small angles. And you could never get the Argosy to fly a steady course. It would fly within a few degrees of what you wanted. And, but it was always barging along a little bit skew if. And exactly the same happened to the packet. Do you remember the American packet? And the French one, made one a... One nine, it? Yes. Mm. And the French made a, a, a boxy aeroplane. Mm. And of course the General Aircraft Freighter, which was another big four-engine box, they all showed the same thing. They would not fly in a straight line within a few degrees. Now, I interrupted you. Going I was just going to say, before we leave the Vicar, Jock told me about the problems they had on, on pitch control on the approach. And they had to devise some cunning electronic system with, with um, micro switches and the uh, audios um, and things. Were, were you involved in that? No. Well, the only thing I remember about the Viscount on the approach uh, now, there's two things, it so happens. Full flap on the Viscount was 47 degrees, and the stall at 47 degrees of flap with power on was dreadful. So they had a little trick on the Viscount that you made an approach at 40 flap, at which the stall was just acceptable. But to get 47 flap for the shortest landing distance, you could only get it power off. So as you came in and flared to land and closed the throttles, you selected 47 and the flaps went down. If you changed your mind at the last moment and opened up to go around, the flaps automatically came back to 40. So that was one of the tricks with micro switches. The other thing, which we, we only found out about accident by accident, was that if you did a very late go around, in ground effect, the machine pitched very hard nose down and you had to pull hard up elevator to avoid hitting the ground. It, of course, it would be a very remote event to make a go around so late that having closed the throttle and prepared to flare to land, even then you change your mind to go around. You walk the throttles open, the slipstream hits the ground and comes up 
and affects the tail plane and pitches the aeroplane hard nose down. And you had to pull full up elevator momentarily to stop the nose wheel hitting the ground. But you, you could just get away with it. And these little quirks are fully covered in the flight manual. The pilots are warned that if once in a blue moon they do a very late go around in a Viscount, they must be prepared for a strong nose down pitch. You also flew the Britannia, uh, the Brabazon, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, I, I, I thought I'd only done two flights, but I looked at my logbook last night and I discovered I did three. I did one at forward CG, which I always do, one at aft CG, which I always do, and one at a reasonable weight in mid CG. Now, the Brab 1 only did 100 hours altogether, because when it came up to its first 100 hour inspection, no one was prepared to pay for it. Not the MOD, not BOAC, not Bristol. So, and they realized the aeroplane would never work. It was miles too slow, miles too slow, ever to be a serious contender on the North Atlantic. But it was a remarkable aeroplane. It's still the largest span aeroplane that has flown, except for the goose, you know. Spruce goose. Yeah. Yes. It was a 240-foot span, and when it taxied out, it looked tired. You see, being such a span, the wings sort of hung down. And they didn't come up a bit like um, a B-36 until the aeroplane was flying. And it flew very softly and very gently. It had the softest gear I've ever used. And when Bill Pegg was showing it to me on the day I was going to fly, he said, there's a little light there by the airspeed indicator. And I said, what's that for? He said, well, that's to let you know when you've taken off. He said, because the gear is so soft, he said, you don't know when you're off. And he said, not only that, he said, it tells you when you land. I said, come off it. It can't be that good. He said, you wait. Well, we opened up and took off. And he was quite right. Um, what little gentle rumbling there was, it was there all the time. And after a bit, it was obvious that I was 100 feet in the air. And the rumbling was generally like nothing was done. So it was true. And when we came to land, we came in, fled, landed, and I waited and I waited and I thought, well, you know, like, when is it going to land? And I said to Bill, it, it was all so slow, you see, it was so big, it was very slow. And Bill looked at me and he said, cocky bugger, he said, you've been down 10 seconds. He said, that light's been on 10 seconds. And he said, if that light is on, you're down. The main gear is on the ground. And I'm not kidding, it was that soft. You couldn't tell you were on the ground. It had a huge space on board, didn't it? I mean, it was a bit like the old Empire flying boats. Yes, it did. And you see, there was a guy who interviewed me some years ago. He wanted to know about aeroplanes. And the only thing he printed about the Brab, for which I will never forgive him, so I won't tell you his name. In fact, I've forgotten it. Um, was this. It was a big fag to fly the Brab. It took hours to get it ready to fly, because it kept going U.S. The first time I wanted to fly it, it came out of the hangar being towed by a truck. And when it nearly got to the runway, it turned around and went back. And Ben said, oh, God, it's gone U.S. It went U.S. while they were towing it. But if you flew it, you had to do like five hours to make it worthwhile. And on the first flight I did, Bill was in the right seat. I was flying it in the left seat. And we had a spare crew. Walter Gibb was on board and my bloke, Jeff Howitt, was on board. So after two and a half hours, Bill Pegg said to me, stop flying now. He said, let Gibb and Jeff Howitt look after it. He said, we're going to have lunch. Well, normally, if you eat at all on a test flight, you're lucky if you get a sandwich, you know, while you're flying, and, and a little bottle of lemonade or something, but not, not on the Brabazon. We got out, the other two got in, we went aft, and in one of the cabins, there was a table with white cloth and a steward. And Bill and I sat down and had a proper lunch served by a steward, there was that room on the aeroplane. And then when we finished, like took about 45 minutes, we had everything except wine, um, we went back and finished the program. The other, the last point about the, the Brabazon, it did everything slowly and gently and sort of inevitably. When you stalled it, which took hours for it to slow down and pull and pull and pull, eventually the wing would start to drop and that was the stall. So you applied opposite air run, a little bit of rudder, and pushed. And it took, it took about 30 seconds to complete this manoeuvre. See, on a small aeroplane, you can stall and recover, and it's all over in five or ten seconds. On this, the wing dropped, 
you applied the correct controls, but it took ages, and the machine flew a huge path like that, and it recovered, pointing 90 degrees to starboard. The aeroplanes, they were ordinary plonk aeroplanes, but they gave one or two interesting problems. And there are two on the Bristol Freighter. Do you remember the, the cargo aeroplane, the Bristol Freighter? They made a Mark 31 and a 32. Now, that was another boxy shape aeroplane, which wouldn't fly in a straight line. But the worst feature of it was the enormous angles of side slip that could be generated. There is an airworthiness requirement which says that you must drive the aeroplane to a full rudder, full aileron side slip condition. Where an aeroplane doesn't generate large angles of yaw or side slip, it's not so bad. But where you have an aeroplane where the enormous box fus fuselage is very dominant, you can get, in my view, astronomical angles of side slip. And on the Bristol Freighter, while Bill Pegg was flying with me, and I've said earlier, he didn't like this work, and I, I have sympathy, I had sympathy with it. Um, I was getting up to 28 and 29 degrees of straight, steady side slip, which was frightening. Instead of the airplane flying like that, it was flying like that, and it, it got worse and worse and worse. And I was within a whisker of full aileron where the exercise academically would stop. Now, Bill Pegg didn't like it. And, of course, he was quite a senior chap. He said, look, I don't like this. He said, for Christ's sake, let's go home. So we went home. And then the next day, I had dear old Godfrey Orty again. You see? So Godfrey came in. And he said, God, I get lumbered with all the work you do. I said, that's okay. Just sit there. And I, I couldn't say put the gear up and down because it didn't go up and down on the freighter. But we, we explored this side slip. And very carefully, we finally got to max aileron and rudder in, in a crossed sense 31 degrees of side slip and even I thought this is absurd you know what are the requirements requiring this for but of course it wasn't the fault of the requirements it was the sort of aeroplane that was being flown so when I got back on the ground I said to Russell I said look I don't like this test any more than Bill Pegg but you ought to do something about it you want to limit the angle to which you can go. And he smiled. You see, designers are very clever. He said, we can do that. I said, how are you going to do that? He said, well, we're going to put interference stops on the control cables. And he said, we're going to put positive stops in there, which will limit the side slip angle. In other words, if you apply full rudder, you can't get full A run. You can get like three quarters, but not full. Conversely, if you apply full aileron, you can't get full runner. You can only get three quarters. And he said that will limit the side slip angle to about 25 or 26 degrees. And he said, you felt quite comfortable at that, didn't you? I said, yes, I did. It was only the last few that frightened the pants off me. So that's what they did. They put that trick into the Bristol Freighter and it worked. Now, for another reason, they had to do the same on the Britannia. And because that, they didn't have cables on that, they had a high-speed shafting, which was going round and round, driving the controls. And that aeroplane, um, it wasn't so much the side slip case, it was the fact that the machine was laterally unstable. And it is laterally unstable, you will hardly credit this, because it was built with exactly half the degree of static dihedral than it should have had. And Russ himself told me this, when I criticised the Britannia for lack of lateral stability, we went out to dinner that night, and he said, your criticism doesn't surprise me a bit. And I said, well, why doesn't it? Why haven't your pilots told you? He said, well, we haven't quite got that far yet. But he said he designed the, the Britannia to have, whatever, five degrees of static dihedral. And he said, before the aeroplane flew, a long time before it flew, he was down in the hangar looking at these massive castings, which is where the wing joins the fuselage. And he looked at the angle, and he could see it, was, it wasn't big, it wasn't five degrees. And when he went back to his own drawings, he found it was five degrees. When he went back to the, whatever you call, the constructional drawings, it was two and a half degrees. And they've never worked out why it went wrong. So the Brit was built with only two and a half degrees of static dihedral.
And the way they got out of that was to limit the angle at which you could drive it in a side slip, which is the way you prove lateral stability, by interfering with the controls in exactly the same fashion as they did on the freighter. Didn't the Brit have little turn-ups at the wingtips? Why am I thinking of another aircraft? I, no, no. Hey, hang on a minute. Sorry. You're right, it did. And that was another effort to improve the lateral stability because this interference maybe uh, didn't quite do the thing and they did turn the wingtips up. That's quite right. Mm. So just, if I can just catch you on, uh, I, I've never fully understood the Britannia control system because that was basically electric, wasn't it? No, no. Now, it? Th this again is interesting. Farnborough designed the Britannia control system on the same grounds as the Sperrin. Do you remember the mm -hmm. Sperrin? Well, the, experiment, the Sperrin was an experimental bomber and it never got anywhere. But it had what is called a free servo tab control system. And the Brit had the same thing. When you waggle the controllers on a Britannia, you didn't waggle the primary surface. You waggled a tab on the back end of it. And when you displaced the tab, the tab worked the main surface for you. On the ailerons as well? On the ailerons, the rudder, and the elevator. That's how they worked. And, um, but they, they were by cables, were they? Or? No, high-speed shafting. Ah, oh, that's, that's what I was coming to. Yeah. The high-speed shafting, would that be analogous to, um, say, the old-fashioned factories where you had a central power source and long shafts in the roof with, with pulleys on them? Yes, just, you would. And you, then you just lock, lock the belt on if you wanted to start your particular yes, machine. Yes, it was very similar to that, except the power source was yeah. you on the flight deck doing this. Oh, I see. Yes, and instead of having cables running, it was high. There were little uh, diffs, you know, like a motor car. Diff at every corner there was a diff, but the loads were very, very small. I mean, people used to play about with Brits going down into the cargo hold and twisting these and flying the airplane on it. You you could influence the airplane. But you see, one other snag, I don't know why we are back on the Brit. It it caused Bristol a lot of problems. The lateral stability was poor. But the roll rates, the rate at which you could roll the aeroplane, was abysmal. When I first flew it, I was appalled. And when we came home, poor old Bill, he said, you're not going to carry a banner for roll rates now, are you? I said, probably, yeah. Um, if you were coming into land in a Britannia and you wanted to roll it because you weren't lined up with the runway, you could apply full wheel. It took ages to come round, and then you had to apply wheel the other way to stop it where you wanted to go in. I'd never struck this problem before. We took the machine away into free air, and we measured the roll rates from 30 degrees one way to 30 the other way. It took 30 seconds. Can you imagine? 30, maybe it was 29, but it was appalling. But this, this is surely a contradiction in terms, because, I mean, the... the Lower the lateral stability, surely, the higher the roll rate. Yes, but not with this crazy free servo system, and I'll explain uh -huh. why in a minute. Uh -huh. When I got down, again Russell turned up, ah, and he said, what now? I said, look, your roll rates are unbelievably awful. He said, yeah, we know that. And then he smiled and he said, but you haven't got any requirements for roll rate, have you? Now, I knew we didn't, you see. And when I got back to London and talked to my boss, old Walter Ty, he said, oh dear, he said, is it so bad that you are not going to have it? I said, yes, it is. It's, it's quite awful. So he said, well, what, what are we going to do about a requirement? And I said, look, give me a little time and we will establish the requirement. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to fly every big aeroplane we've got in the UK and measure the roll rate. So I talked to BOAC. I was good friends with BOAC. And I said, I want half an hour on a strat. I want half an hour on a Connie, I want half an hour on a Hermes 4 to measure. And of course, Jackie Harrington was their director. He said, yeah, you can have it. He said, hop on a training program. So I flew the Strat, the Connie, the Hermes 4. We also flew a lot of small aeroplanes and we measured the roll rates. And then we plotted them on a piece of graph paper and they all sort of fell about there. They were all sensible. The Brit was out here on its own. It was miles adrift. So we wrote a roll rate requirement, which was a minimum of 10 degrees a second, I think it was. And then we went back to Russell and we said, that's what you're going to meet. And he said, ah, we figured out why it won't roll. And I said, why is that? Now, it's most interesting. It had a free servo tab 
the wind blew over the tab, you waggled the tab and the tab waggled the surface. But at low speed all the ailerons floated up, which, which they will do if they are ordinary free controls. They floated up. And when you got down to about 1.2 VS, just above the stall, the ailerons were fully up. So that if you wanted to roll the aeroplane, now remember this from your early flying, normally the ailerons are in the middle, and when you want to roll, one goes down and one goes up. But in the case of the Brit, the one that should have gone up was already fully up. It, it had floated fully up, which meant that only the one that could go down could go down. So instead of having ailerons on both wings, in effect you only had an aileron on one wing. That's why the roll rate was half that it was designed to be. So Bristol's had to frig that. They had to improve the roll rate. Now do you know, this is where my memory lets me down. Oh, I know what they did. They put weak downsprings on the aileron tabs. They didn't affect the normal flying of the aeroplane because they were weak. But when you got to low speed, they stopped the ailerons floating up. So when you got down to very low speed, both the ailerons were in the middle of their travel, so that when you asked for a roll rate, one went down and the other could go up, and you got the roll rate back. Fascinating. Now that was a that was a long digression from the Bristol freighter, but fascinating. Yes, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. You see, people used to say to me, and it happened a lot more in recent times. Don't criticize this because we can't fix it. And if you insist, it's going to cost a fortune and take a year. In the end, I never believed them. And I never allowed that to influence me. If something was wrong, it was wrong. And regardless of the cost and the time, it had to be fixed. And given time, it was fixed. Always. No one was ever defeated. I remember at a lecture, I'm leaping ahead now, but I remember at a lecture I gave to one of Freddie Laker's mobs. He was president of the SLAT, and I gave a lecture to his flight engineers. Well, society of what? Licensed license aircraft engineers and technologists. And I gave a lecture to them on the flying qualities of aeroplanes. And at the end of it, incidentally, it was that which caused me to write that book later. And at the end of it, Freddie, with his usual directness, he got up and he said, I want to ask you a question. I said, go on then. He said, why do the Americans build better aeroplanes than we do? Now, that's a good question. And I said, I know the answer to that. He said, well, tell us. He said, because nobody else seems to know. I said, well, I can give you one, one reason. Ah, and was it so true? When you build an aeroplane, your own pilots fly it. And they tell you whether it's good, bad or indifferent. They might even tell you you've got a bloody great snag on it. You might get other pilots in, in our case, civil pilots like us, ARB, or if it's a military aeroplane, you get Boscom or Farnborough. And, and they usually agree with the company pilots. They say, oh, you've got a terrible problem. The same thing happens in the States. You can have big problems on aeroplanes in the States. But the difference is this. It's the attitude of the chief designer. In America, a chief designer listens to his pilots. And if they say, holy smoke, you've got a snag, you'll never get away with that, you've got to fix it. They will fix it. Doesn't matter what it costs, or the delay, they fix it there and then. They work like mad, and they put a new, I mean, in principle, they would put a new wing on. They would do anything to fix it. They fly the aeroplane again three or four months later, and it's great. In the UK, the chief designer says, oh, I've got a big problem. And he goes on saying, oh, I've got a big problem. And the aeroplane flies, they get on with other work, but that problem is there. And then when you say to him, well, what are you going to do about it? He says, oh, I don't know. And then about eight months later, nobody's done anything. And if you get hold of these guys, they are hoping that the problem will quietly go away. But it doesn't go away. And then given time, somebody who really matters, like a customer pilot or a certification pilot comes along, and they shut up shop on them, and they say, look, you cannot have that aeroplane certificated as it is, you've got to do it. And then the threats start. Then they start getting hold of your boss and saying, oh, God, if you go on like this, you're going to put the program back 12 months, it's going to cost 10 million quid. Well, of course, these days they would say it'll cost 100 million. And there's a lot of pressure then to start bending the requirements and accepting the aeroplane. 
But that's the big difference. And that's why the Americans produce better aeroplanes miles quicker. You see, some of the differences in certification times you couldn't believe. The ambassador in its day, the prototypes flew for seven years before it was certificated. I mean, it appeared at the Farnborough Air Show ad nauseum. Every year, dear old George flying it, it went on and on and on forever. The Trident won, which isn't ancient history. I mean, that's a 1960 aeroplane. They had a 12 months hiatus because of storm problems. The Americans would never have tolerated a 12 months hang up in the middle of a program. When Boeing were going to do the 747, one of the guys said to me, we've got a program for this aeroplane, four aircraft, 1300 hours, 12 months. When I went back later, Ed Wallace it was, he came to me beaming all over his face. He said, do you remember that forecast? I said, yeah. He said, well, look at this. Four aeroplanes, 12 months, 1301 hours. All done. C of A for the whole damn issue. Our aeroplanes spend years staggering through certification. Of course, you see, it doesn't apply anymore because we don't make any more aeroplanes. The only production aeroplanes we have now are Jetstream 125, Avro 748, poof. They're trying to get rid of them too. Oh God, that's a heap, I know. But we were always slow. But the biggest point was the refusal of the British chief designer to listen to his pilots, believe he had a snag, and damn well fix it. That was the problem. I can think of a number of British designers who were, were brilliant, but very idiosyncratic. Yes. They'd come out with brilliant original ideas, but yeah. the actual engineering of them, right through to the practical outcome, yeah. i.e. a safe aeroplane in the sky, was a much more difficult passage. Yeah. And you see, I don't want to preempt what we might talk about on uh, Comet 1, but, but uh, Bishop was a frightfully autocratic man. And it was his boast, when the Trident 1 was finally certificated, and there was a big problem in it, which we'll come to, he pulled a, a drawing out of his desk to Hardingham, because they were buddies years ago, and he said, how about that, Bob? He said, that's how, how I designed it, and that's how it was certificated. He wouldn't let anybody, including John Cunningham, influence what he had done with that aeroplane. But in the long term, he lost out and he had to modify it. However, there we are. Comet 1 and 1A. The Comet 1 prototype flew first in 1949, and I started work on it early in 1950. It was certificated soon after and served well until two disappeared in flight off Elba. The subsequent public inquiry results are well known to the older people. The aeroplane was totally ignored by the Americans who still believe that the jet age started in 1959 with their 707, coincident incidentally with the Comet 4. The early Comets were comparatively soft and gentle aeroplanes. They flew very like, say, a four-engine Meteor, which itself was nice. The machine, however, was significant in terms of flying qualities for two things its spring field elevator and its ground stall. Elevator field was provided by a simple spring because the main surface was fully powered. The system had two characteristics which were critical. The breakout load of around 12 to 15 pounds and the load to proof G at the limiting flight condition which could be as low as 39 pounds. Now this, this allowance... What, what's proof G, please? Proof G is the G at which the aeroplane will start to bend and ultimate is the loading at which it will break. And proof G on a civil aeroplane is 2.5 G. The breakout load was 12 to 15 pounds and the load to proof G was about 39 pounds. Now this allowance in between of 27 pounds stick force wasn't much in which to accommodate the control movements necessary to look after the machine in difficult flying condition. I tried hard to get de Havilland's to modify the aircraft, but dear old Bishop with his autocratic way wouldn't have anything to do with it, and John Cunningham was not prepared to differ from 
his boss's views. In the end, the subject went to the ARB Council, and they, the chairman of which at that time was Lord Brabazon, finally accepted the airplane in spite of protestations on my part and the rest of my staff. The reason, I think, was the clout which Bishop, justifiably perhaps in those days, was able to raise, supported by John Cunningham, who even then was of course a big name, and finally Majin Dee, who, although quite young, had the courage, or you might say the cheek, to speak for the Comet Fleet, the BOAC Comet Fleet. Anyway, sometimes later, the one breakup in flight over India in a thunderstorm showed that in the end we were right and they were wrong. Marks of Comet from, from then on were fitted with Q-field elevators and typical of an over-response. The base law was V to the 2.2 instead of a simple square V squared. This led to a very heavy elevator at high speeds, particularly on the 4B, which had a very high VDF, maximum flight diving speed of 406 knots. But then Hatfield declared, quote, that no pilot was going to pull the wings off another comet, unquote. This occasion when the council went against the strong technical recommendation of its own staff was the only occasion for a very long period of time and spoke well for the general mutual confidence which existed between us and the council. In fact, now that I think about it a little more deeply, it was the only disagreement with the old ARB on the flight side. Now, the second problem on the comet was the ground store. Which problem was not identified by us, nor by the inhabitants, nor indeed by BOAC in the early days? Fate decided that Foot, Captain Foot, had to demonstrate it inadvertently on a BOAC machine at night at Rome, although he didn't kill anybody. The takeoff simply turned into an overrun. But Charles Pentland for CPA did on a Canadian machine in Karachi, and they were all killed. The fact was simply that the machine could be rotated on takeoff to a pitch angle, even without scraping the tail, which exceeded the stalling angle of the wing, so that the machine just sat there without lifting off and would run on indefinitely. This led to a reprofiled wing leading edge called a droop snoot on all subsequent marks of comet and proved a lesson to the rest of the Western world designers. No one really grumbled about the consequent testing and flight testing, some of which high angle takeoffs were quite hairy. For example, the 707-436 at Edwards and the early DH-125 at Hatfield. The breakup over India, I didn't really, that was um, a structural failure in the aircraft, but totally dissimilar to the, one, the, the failures that happened over the Mediterranean. It wasn't y a pressurization yes. failure. No, it wasn't. The two in the med yeah. were bursts of the pressure cabin at the ADF cutout windows, where the radius of the cutout was too sharp, and the cracks all originated in those corners. The loss was in, of the other aeroplane was in a thunderstorm over Karachi, where the machine broke up in flight. It had been overstressed in flight. And it is my view... The hit of violent wind shear. Yes, mm. and the pilot overcorrected the aeroplane, mm. put much too much G on it. He obviously went past ultimate and broke. The wings came off. Your um, explanation of the, the ground stalling, um, was the strange condition whereby you could um, exceed, if you like, the maximum angle of attack without scraping the tail. Was the wing mounted with quite a substantial angle of, angle of attack in relation to the fore and aft line of the aircraft? No, it wasn't. It hadn't got an inbuilt angle of attack. No, it no. But I can tell you why it happened. When the Second World War finished, most of the British designers were invited to Germany to look at the very end of the German research programs on aerodynamics, which included, amongst other things, V1s and V2s. Bishop went over with several of the other chief designers, and the one thing that obviously struck him was that the German preferred wing section was a symmetrical section. 
from beginning to end a symmetrical wing section. Now the only advantage of that is that an aeroplane will, will fly as well upside down as the right way up. I don't see any particular advantage in that for a civil aeroplane. Now the Comet came out with substantially a symmetric wing section so that when you take it to high incidence it doesn't muck about, it'll suddenly stall. The flow will break down over the nose, over the leading edge and then the wing will not produce any more lift. And it was almost... Now you see, had you put a symmetrical wing section on the ambassador just for the sake of argument, this problem wouldn't have arisen because you couldn't rotate an ambassador far enough to get into trouble. But the comet sat rather high and with this symmetrical wing section, when you rotate it for takeoff, if you pulled it too high too soon, the wing was stalled. Except you didn't know. You just sat there in total ignorance and the machine would not lift off. Now this guy, Michael Foote, he did it accidentally on a dark night at Rome. It didn't lift off. In the end he had to throttle back and overrun the runway, but he didn't hurt anybody. But this other guy, Charles Pentland, chief pilot for CPA, it was a disaster. When it happened, Cunningham rang me and said, have you heard? And I said, yeah. I said, I can't understand it. He said, neither can I. He said, I told Charles all about it. I told him exactly what to do. Now Charles Pentland did the same thing. He had a Comet 1A, which was a bit heavier, same engines. He rotated too far. He realized what he'd done, and he put the nose back down, which unstalled the wing, but then, because the end of the runway was coming up, he lifted it off, but he left it a few seconds too late. And the machine did leave the ground, but the gear hit a low stone wall, and that was enough to bring the aeroplane down. And it went on into the bundu, and they were all killed. Now, if, if you have a, a symmetrical aerofoil cross-section uh, that is flying, if you like, directly along, you're not going to generate any pressure differential. Oh, you, you've got, got to have an angle of incidence. So that's what I mean. You've always yes. got to have an angle of incidence. Yes, you it. have, yes. Um, now, subsequent designs, I mean, for the sake of argument, the 707 wing section, was that, was that symmetrical as well? Oh, no, cranky, no. no. When the world heard of the problems, I mean, the Comet one wasn't perfectly symmetrical. Mm. but it was sort of symmetrical because you've got to get a pressure differential above and below the wing. But when the world heard of the results of this, and England is good at publicising its cock-ups as well as its triumphs because we told the three American constructors all about the Trident and the BC-10 and the BAC-111 superstore problems and they all benefited from it. But in the case of the Comet, it was then fitted with a droop snoot where the leading edge was tapered downward so that instead of looking symmetric, it looked like a little bit like a claw pointing downwards. And that was a permanent feature? It wasn't yes, it was built slanted. into the wing leading edge mm -hmm. because the Comet one had a fixed wing leading edge. And it means that the wing will go on generating lift to a much higher angle of attack so that on the, com on the droop snoot comets, which was the well, the three only flew experimentally, but the Comet 4, you could do a tail dragging takeoff what we call a VMU, a minimum liftoff, and the machine would take off and climb away. And that test was thereafter done on all civil aeroplanes for certification. Right. So that's the one on the 1A? Yes. That you've described. Um, what was the next one? You went, went on to the 4, did you? Or did you well, the on? next one which was delivered was the 4. There was a 3, mm -hmm. which was a, it was a prototype Comet 4. It was only pressurized to 2 or 3 pounds PSI. So we had to wear oxygen all the time we flew it, which was a bit of a pain. But then the Comet 4 came out, and it had all the goodies. It had reverse thrust. It was a bigger aeroplane. It wasn't faster. It was... The Comet 4 actually was quite slow. It had a, a limiting airspeed of 300 knots and a VDF of about 350. I mean, if one looks at it now, it was a quite slow aeroplane. But it had a very high altitude capability. All the comets were very happy flying up at 40 and 42,000 feet, 45,000 feet. They flew well up there, whereas these modern high-performance aeroplanes don't ever get up there. What was the wing loading on a Comet 4? Well, it must have been, I don't know the number, but it must have been very low. Below but 100 pounds a square foot? I wouldn't know. But it was obviously low, a bit like a Canberra. Yeah. See, any aeroplane with a big, with a whacking great wing is, is as happy as hell at high altitude. They flew beautifully up there. Right. Even the Comet 1. The Comet 1 was small. It weighed 105,000 pounds and the engines were four times 3,500 pounds thrust. 
which is poof, it's nothing. Let's really. not think engine. No, no. I know. When you think that we now have one engine producing 65,000 pounds of thrust, like a thumping great, um, what's the big Rolls Royce engine? Well, it's the Trent, isn't it? Yes, no, but the one that's flying now, even. Um, well, it's, it's the RB211. The RB211, that's right. Uh, 524 yes, or something. Yes, that's it? right, that's right. Um, They're up to about 60,000 pounds of thrust. Um, and then the big American GE90, isn't it? Yeah. That's coming in at an even higher yeah. thrust rating. Well, the new Trent that you, you mentioned, mm. that's going to start life at about 85. Yeah. And they are hoping it'll eventually make, can you believe it, 100,000 pounds thrust. Mm. Okay, so that. Now, just to finish off, the Comet 4 came out. It was entirely predictable. It didn't have a ground stall. Bishop had to give in and fit Q feel to the aeroplane. And Cunningham had the decency to admit that the aeroplane was vastly improved. And it worked well. It had good stalls. It had good everything. And it served well for a long time. There was a 4 for BOAC. There was a 4B, which was produced for BEA which had a much higher limiting airspeed, something like 350 knots, with a VDF of 406, and then there was a 4C. I've forgotten who bought the 4C, but eventually the RAF inherited the 4C, and they flew it for years. Mexicans bought it among others. Oh, they? yes, mm. that's right. Mm. But they had very high power-to-weight power to ratios, didn't they? They did, yes, they did. They had a lot of steam and a lot of mm. performance for their day. Because a friend of mine who flew for Kuwait Airways, um, f um, he was on a pilgrimage charter, and they were, of course, loaded very heavily. Yeah. And they were flying out of Jeddah, climbing out, and yeah. he had a bird strike in one engine. Uh -huh. And he said it hardly f affected the performance at all. No. Literally, they had a low fuel load, but uh, yeah. uh, because of the power of the engine. Yes. Of course, the other good thing about the Comets, the engines were set well inboard. They had no what we call VMC problems. A very like a VC-10. On the VC-10, the engines were well inboard, in spite of the fact they were right aft. And you could cut an engine on takeoff, and it didn't make a hapeth of difference. Instead of having a VMCG, like on a 707, which would be around 120 knots, there wasn't a VMCG on a VC-10 for a one-engine-out case. You could keep the, the aeroplane straight all the way from 10 knots upward. Mm -hmm. And even in the two-out case, where Vickers had two, declare a two-engine out VMCG, academically they say, well, how about 100 knots? And it worked. You could cut two engine on one side at 100 knots and it would go straight off the ground. Now, the Comet was very similar to that. The only thing about the Comet, which I sort of didn't like in the end, was that it inherited the original flight deck layout, which was, after all, designed in about 47, 48. And it was still flying in the late 1960s. And the flight deck of the Comet looked like the stokehold of a trawler. You know, there were pipes all over the place. And half the time you expected to see steam coming out of them. And there were great big gauges and levers all over the place. Oh, it wasn't styled in any way. And the poor old flight engineer had an uncomfortable time. He didn't even have a table to lean on, you see. He had to hold his charts on his knees while he fiddled with all these levers. And so had it had a navigator as well, didn't it? It had a navigator, yes. Mm. Yeah. When, when you were looking into the problem of the ground stall on the 1A and the 1, yeah. um, where did you carry out your tests? You must have needed a very long runway. Well, it was done eventually at Stansted, the ones we did. Stansted's quite a long runway. This was years ago, of course. Mm. But it was a long United States Air Force base, wasn't it, Stansted, during the war? That's right. And um, I've forgotten now the length of it, but it was plenty long enough to do VMUs even on things like VC-10s. And you re reproduced the ground stall quite easily. Oh, no, we, no one ever reproduced it. I mean, um, de Havilland's did some work with tufts on it. Mm. And you could see that if you rotated the machine to high incidence on the ground at 90, 100, 110 knots, the wing was stalled. All the tufts were all, all to hell, Ooh, blowing all yeah. over the shop. Yeah. Any, any, other, any other problems on the Comet 4 otherwise? No, yeah. no. It was a perfectly ordinary aeroplane and did well. There was a crash of a 4B at Ankara. Due that a, was... Um, due to a stall, I believe, wasn't it? No. Well, it was in the end, but it wasn't really a stall. BEA fitted the Smith flight system on their aeroplane, which had a pitch director, which the pilots used to follow on takeoff. Now, that was a night takeoff, a pitch black night takeoff. And if my memory serves, 
well enough. It was that this pitch director was stuck very high up and the more the pilot pursued it, the more it went up. And he pulled the aeroplane right up in, to an absurd angle. And because it was night, and uh, I assume he, because he didn't have the wit to check with the standby artificial horizon, of which there is always one, he got the machine much too high. Or check the airspeed. Well, yes, he must have been losing airspeed like mad, too. But anyway, he took the machine right up, and it stalled and went in. Fundamentally, it's like all accidents. There is no single cause, or rarely is there a single cause for an accident. It's a combination of circumstances with a crew member, with all respect to this guy, and many others, not checking sufficiently and compounding the loss. You wanted to say a few words about Douglas Bader, then? Oh, yes. At some time, Douglas Bader rang me up and asked me to go and do a test flight for him on the F-27 at Skipark. He said what he called the Shell Air Force was going to buy it. So I said, yes, I'd love to. So he and I went over in one of his aeroplanes, which I've forgotten what it was. Apprentice or something, didn't he have? Fun? Didn't he have Apprentice or something he used to fly about in? Mm, I can't remember that. That sized aircraft, anyway. Yes. Yeah. But anyway, we went to Skip Hall, met Fokkers, did this long flight on the F-27. He got a bit bored with it, actually, after, after a bit, like, because we were up about three hours, you see, and I was doing a proper job. And he got a bit impatient at the end. He kept saying, well, like, that's enough, you know, and whatever. I said, well, just hang on a minute, I just want to finish. So uh, we, we did it. But at the end of that day, and having heard so much about Bader, never having met him, he intrigued me. And there were three things which I distinctly remember. In spite of it being like the 1950s, he said, quote, he didn't like runways, he much preferred grass. Well, that was typical of the man, wasn't it? The other thing is, and I feel a bit shy about saying this, but he swore like a trooper all the time. And this gave me a, a sort of a strange comfort because I always did, I regret to say, and I felt guilty about it. The other point was that he refused the lift when we got to the skip all control tower. And he stumped up every one of the, I don't know, hundred steps to get to the top for lunch. When he got to the top, the perspiration was pouring from him. And I thought he was going to die. But he did it all the time, apparently. Now, when we got back to Croydon, now I say Croydon, we must have gone over in a small aeroplane. When we got back to Croydon, he showed me his Alvis car. He was very fond of it. And it was non-standard in that. The clutch pedal was on the right, but didn't work because the clutch was withdrawn electrically whenever the gear lever knob was grasped. The throttle pedal was in the middle, and the brake pedal was on the left, because he needed his better leg for the force required to operate the brakes. He drove it perfectly, and he said that no one would ever really pinch it, because they would have pranged it in the first ten yards. And I believed him. After the Britannia 100, there was a Britannia 300, which was supposed to be a very long-range aeroplane. And indeed, to some extent, it was. Bristol's were hoping to sell it to CPA in Vancouver. And there was declared to be a proving flight, London-Vancouver Direct, which for those days was a long way. Gibb was in command of the aeroplane. I was the co-pilot. We had a flight engineer, lots of people on board, including Peter Macefield. And he was there as sort of commander-in-chief of the whole exercise. Now, I'll never forget this flight because it nearly finished before it started, which is a curious thing to say. But we were parked on the North Apron at Heathrow before they built the buildings. There were still tents there in those days. And the machine was facing south, parked on the grass. It was full of fuel, up to the gills. And it was all figured out and we were all ready to go. We got on board. Walter Gibbs started up the engines. He started up number one, number two, number three, and then something felt curious, and I realized that the machine was moving slowly forward. And I shouted at Walter, I said, we're moving, put the brakes on. He stood on the brakes, and nothing happened, because, because some of the essential electrical equipment hadn't been switched on. Now, we had about, eight, we had all the engines running by this time, and the machine had got across the North Apron. It was beginning to run onto the grass. 
and in those days there were enormous concrete blocks the size of a small room which was something to do with the wartime prepar um, defense of Heathrow or whatever it was then and we were approaching these and I couldn't believe it I was looking at these blocks slowly coming towards us I looked at these propellers going round and I thought we are going to hit them and this flight will stop before it started I could have wept Gibbs saw he was in deep trouble he had no brakes his only salvation was reverse thrust now he couldn't get reverse thrust because the flight control locks were still in and you cannot get reverse you can't open the throttles if all the flight controls are locks are in so he took the control locks out and you know when you want something to happen if you've got to wait two seconds it feels like half an hour I mean and that's uh, that's not an exaggeration the control locks took a long time to come out on the Brit there were little red warning lights which en went out one by one they probably all came out within two seconds but it felt like half an hour during which time the machine was approaching these concrete blocks eventually the locks came out he was then able to apply full reverse thrust and he whacked it up and the machine slowed down and I was looking at number four prop we got within about four feet of these gigantic blocks and the machine stopped couldn't you just cut the engine oh we'd, we'd still have rolled into it we would still have rolled into them and you see the the Brit had uh, the props I think I mentioned were not connected to the engine they just spun um, anyway he stopped it with on my side about four feet between number four prop and this thumping great lump of concrete and then he held it on and we backed away slowly and then when it was back on the concrete he they uh, he shut down and the people put the chocks there it was close we then backed the airplane the it was pushed back by a tug and Gibbs said I want it refilled and uh, Macefield said oh come on you know you've only used a bit and Gibbs said no fear he said we used we must have used you know several hundred gallons he said I want it so they filled it up again very wisely it showed later and then we finally taxed it out and we took off we took the whole length of what was then 28 right to get off and we flew to Vancouver I did the bulk of the flying because Gibb was busy chatting with people and everything and we finally got up to 35,000 feet which was the maximum altitude for a Brit were you, were you on cruise flying? yes we were and it had to be fl hand flown the whole time we finally got up to 35,000 when we were still about two hours short of Vancouver it's a long way Vancouver from London particularly in those days I mean I'm not saying Vancouver's got any closer but it was a long way the flight eventually was 14 hours 25 minutes and when we were at the very top within one hour of top of descent I'd be in the right hand seat I had all the fuel system there and all the fuel gauges were on zero but it was a known trick on the on the Brit they showed zero when they were still fuel in the tanks and I said to the flight engineer Christ there can't be much fuel left and he figured it out and he said well we've only got that much but he said if we don't muck about we'll just make it Gibb did his own sums with a more pessimistic answer Peter Macefield did the most optimistic answer he said oh Christ we got plenty of fuel he said we can go to Seattle and Gibb said no we are not going to Seattle we're gonna land at Vancouver so the moment he was within range this was at 35,000 feet he closed the throttles and we did a long descent in fact I don't think he ever opened them again we came all the way down nicely judged to the runway at Vancouver and landed we taxied in parked the airplane big reception you know the press and everybody was there I was more interested in the fuel state I got out of the airplane and I said to the flight engineer what do you reckon there is left he said about four thousand pounds which is you know sweet Fanny Adams he went round and dripped the tanks and there was only two thousand there wasn't enough fuel to do a go around had we had to do it so we were jammy we got in just wasn't there a cross check on the fuel flow meters oh yes everybody ran all their own fuel uh, calculations I don't think there was any doubt that we would make Vancouver because once you close the throttles and come down you're not using fuel anymore not at idle but it was a good job we didn't listen, listen to uh, Peter Macefield otherwise we would have run out between Vancouver and Seattle going right back to the beginning um, weren't the braking circuits part of the startup checks of the aircraft? The switching on of all the electrics was, was part of, of it and it wasn't done. It wasn't done. Now, the Boeing 707 really was 
one of the, the, the world leaders in big uh, transport aeroplanes for its day, produced by uh, the Americans. And the first machine bought by BOAC was one of the big intercontinental 436s. It was a big, hairy-chested aeroplane, but it was unreasonably demanding to fly. The primary flight controls were fundamentally manual. In spite of its size, it weighed about 336,000 pounds although they were supported by powered spoilers for roll and a boosted rudder at larger angles. But the aeroplane was very heavy to fly about all axes and lacked precision over small angles. You couldn't fly it to a degree of heading or a knot of airspeed or a degree of bank. You had to settle for approximately straight and level flight because it was insensitive over small angles. Now, the flight trials at Boeing Field at Seattle went reasonably well in a lot of areas. I mean, the stall qualities, for example, were immaculate. But it, were, it became clear that there were large problems in directional stability and control. Fundamentally, the fin was too small. And this led to all the problems associated a divergent Dutch roll, a violent roll following engine failure in flight, and high minimum control speeds, all compounded by high foot forces in engine out conditions and extremely high foot forces in two engine out conditions. Again, all made worse by, just listen to some of this, the unachievably low minimum control speeds on takeoff and go around. I was appalled when I finished flying the aeroplane. It didn't take any wit on my part to turn the aircraft down on all these grounds. The unfortunate circumstances were that the machine was already FAA certificated and that the FAA test pilot had not been supported by Washington in his attempt to reject the aeroplane. The machine was literally potentially dangerous in the event of engine failure, particularly at the speeds quoted in the FAA flight manual. Boeing simply couldn't believe that we were turning the aeroplane down. In an attempt to limit the damage to their reputation, and knowing in their hearts that the machine was much too demanding, they promised a fix within 12 months if we would accept the aeroplane temporarily. Having been caught before by promises not kept, and truly fearful of an airline pilot failing to control the machine in the event of engine failure on takeoff. I said, no fear, and I came home. There was, of course, an awful fuss. BOAC were furious, though Balpa and the airline pilots in general were all with me. My chairman at the time, Lord Brabazon, who I heard later from his wife, quote, loved a fight, unquote, stuck with me, and together we persuaded the then permanent secretary of the ministry to refuse the machine certification. Some months later, I was recalled to Seattle to fly the improved model. The improvements were a much larger fin, an additional ventral fin, and a powered rudder from zero angle. Now, these physical improvements, coupled with realistically achievable VMC speeds, significantly improved the aeroplane and brought it within acceptable limits in all areas of stability and control, directional stability and control. The roll and roll following engine failure in flight were greatly softened. Rudder forces in the engine out cases came down within limits, although in the two engine out cases they were still very heavy. Size of relief all run. To their credit, Boeing issued these modifications free to all users. If Alpa later wrote a most appreciative letter to ARB, praising it for its courage in resisting commercial and political pressures, and insisting on a proper minimum standard of safety. I was given a copy of that letter, which I quite treasure. Though, to be honest, I didn't find anything particularly praiseworthy in simply sticking to a sensible set of rules, giving an airline pilot a reasonable chance of surviving a known, quite probable, single failure case. Now that's, that's the heart of what the aeroplane was like, the mods that were done, and the way it worked later. But one little thing to explain the feelings of myself and the Boeing pilots on the original program. 
When I made it clear to Boeing that I was going to do an engine failure on takeoff at their declared VMCG speed, the Boeing chief test pilot of the time, he was actually a Canadian called Brian Weigel, who would be riding in the right hand seat, he looked distinctly uncomfortable. I'm not going to say he went white, but he looked a bit concerned. And on the way out of the aeroplane, he took me aside and he said, Look, Dave, for goodness sake, keep your eye on the bloody aeroplane. I said, look, don't worry. I said, I know the fix you're in, and I promise you, we won't leave the concrete. I said, it might be a bit hairy, because you, you are quoting ridiculously low speeds. I said, uh, if I can't hold it, I'll simply throttle back and we'll stay on the concrete. So I said, I'm going to uh, run straight down the middle of the, the center line of the runway, and you cut either number one or number four engine without telling me which. Now, they thought I was going a bit too far in saying that, because when they did engine cuts, they knew which engine was going to fail and which way the aeroplane was going to swing. Now, that's not fair, because an airline pilot, when he takes off, he doesn't know which engine is going to fail. So, that's what we did, and I said I would also wait sufficiently long after the cut to make sure which way the aeroplane was swinging. You see, I've seen people jump on an aeroplane in an engine out takeoff and get the wrong rudder on, and that makes it a thousand times worse. So, in the event, number four was cut at a ridiculously low speed, something like, say, 110 knots, and it was immediately clear to me that there wasn't a hope in hell of containing the lateral deviation within the confines of the runway width. So I simply throttled back and stayed on the hard surface, although the right main gear was very close to the grass. Now, on the modified aeroplane, at its proper speed, which was something like 128, which was a, an increase of about 15 to 18 knots, the deviation was contained within the airworthiness limit of 50 feet. So that was the story on the, the 446. What, and you're, what you're saying then is the improved fin and the ventral fin yeah. were effectively enough effective sufficiently above VMCG to contain any, any deviation on takeoff. Yes. Purely the air, extra air, aerodynamic strength of the or, or plus the fact that we upped the speeds anyway, because they were quoting speeds which were clearly too low. Mm. But the bigger fin made the aeroplane directionally stable. You know, there are some... the increased speed. Oh, yes. Mm. There's some very similar uh, analogies. If you throw a dart without tail feathers on, it tumbles. But you put some tail feathers on, it goes dead straight. If you put a titchy little tail feather on a dart, it might fly straight, but it might... Oscillate. Yes. Well, and it's as simple as that. With a big fin, the aeroplane will go straight. With a small fin, it'll wander all over the place. Now, you see, that's one good reason why the 737 is such a good aeroplane. It's got an enormous fin for its size. For its length, yeah. Yeah. But coupled with the fact, maybe you, you missed it, the original 70, the rudder was manual over the first four degrees each side, and then the rudder boost came in, but it wasn't very strong. And this led to enormous foot forces in the engine out case, 180 pounds, and in the two engine out case it was 220 pounds. It nearly I killed me. Beyond physical ability, Yes, it is. It yeah. is, yes. It was as much as I could do to hold it for two minutes. Now, there was one particularly alarming training incident about this time where they took two engines out on one side, uh, the aircraft rolled, and in fact flung two engines off its wing, didn't it? And oh, it crikey, now, well, now, now that you mention that, I can tell you one or two things. A lot of the American airlines lost a lot of 7.0s on training due to overconfidence, and the reason was, it is said, that Tex Johnson, who only died the other day, oversold the aeroplane. He knew it was a demanding aeroplane. He said to the airlines, don't worry about it, anybody can fly it, it's a piece of cake. And amongst other things, he used to do a roll as a demonstration of it. But when he gave it to the airlines, they took liberties with it. And two I remember distinctly, Lufthansa, when they had their first one, it was rolled by a demonstration Boeing pilot. He then, when he had trained them, went off home. They then started to fly the aeroplane, and they rolled it. And one guy rolled it once, twice, and then lost control of it, and two of the engines came off. Another case was a Dutch roll demonstration out of Seattle with some American company. And the Dutch roll was allowed to go too far, because you know what a Dutch roll is. The machine goes like this. And, of course, the angles of yaw, which they build up, are enormous. 
and the resulting manoeuvres, if you let the Dutch roll get too divergent, can be quite violent. And they, they deliberately let this one go too far. And then the guy who attempted to correct it, corrected it with rudder, which I never agree with, and he got the wrong rudder on. And of course the machine didn't argue, it simply flicked right over. And three of the engines came off. They literally came off the wing and they were left with one. And they had to do a force landing somewhere out in the sticks. They got it down and I think most of them survived because one of the flight test engineers on that flight later qualified as a pilot and flew with me on the 747 program. But there's no doubt the original Semino was very demanding and it was only made even then just acceptable with the modifications that we insisted were put on it. BOAC pilots had difficulty in flying it. They had a lot, lot of failures on the course and it's, you know, it's quite ironic in a way. All the guys who dipped the 707 course were put onto VC-10s because a boy of 16 could fly a VC-10. But it, it, it was an aeroplane, what's that expression? It sorted the boys from the men or the men, men from, from the boys. boys. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It certainly did. Yes, the problems of asymmetric power, which of course the VC-10 never had. No, it didn't. That's quite no. right. But were you responsible for fitting the yaw damper on it? No, that was that in was from square one. one was it yes, all? it was. Yeah. Oh, crikey. If you took the yaw damper out of the original 7 it was all to hell. It was all over the sky. It, it'd go along all day like this, and it made everybody in the back sick. It was... Um, how Boeing attempted to sell it like that beat me. Anyway... It was also what wasn't wasn't the the, the four three six uh, some of the four three sixes improvement was that it had more power. It had a lot more power, um, which uh, was was another snag on the early seven hours. Yes, it, yes, it was. But you see, one demonstration of this question of power, it had Conways. Mind you, the Conway used more fuel than did a Pratt and Whitney, whatever. But it had a lot more net thrust. If you took a more four Net thrust, net thrust, the yeah. actual yeah. amount of thrust which yeah. came out, it was mm. enormous. If you took a 707 with Conway engines to 15,000 feet and flew straight and level and then opened the throttles, it would accelerate all the way out to its limit airspeed, which would be about 380 knots. Then it would go on to 430 knots, which is the maximum dive speed, remember. You're not, a, no, not even a test pilot is allowed to fly faster than that. And when you got to that point, you had to start climbing to keep the machine within its dive speed limit. And this wasn't even at full power. It is at what we call maximum continuous thrust. It was stuffed with performance. Mm. And it was very happy to fly reasonably high, 40,000 feet. And up there it would accelerate way out beyond 0.9 mark. Whereas if you put Pratt & Whitney's in it, it wouldn't do anything like that in terms of performance. But it did umpteen more miles per gallon, you see, which is why most of the world bought the Pratt & Whitney engine aeroplane. Even though the Conway had a moderate amount of bypass. Yes, that's engine, right, you know, yes. Yeah, yeah. But that was just pushing Coffin, Coffin Corner even further out, wasn't it? Well, yes, it was. That combination. Yes. So, I mean, they, presumably trouble would have been met a little later. Yeah. Now, yeah. The, there's one, there's one um, sequence, sequel to this 707. In fact, there are two or three small ones, but let's get rid of the big one. The next 70 was the 336. This was the one where Boeing developed the wing leading edge devices to give more lift. And they carried these wing leading edge devices close into the fuselage. Now, if you do that and you get a lot of lift out of the aeroplane, the machine will pitch up at the stall. As you get close to the stall, instead of the aeroplane remaining stable, so that you've got to keep pulling to come to the storm, it'll start to pitch up. And as it starts to pitch up, you've got to start pushing. Now, this is a complete denial of all the longitudinal stability requirements, the words of which are identical in the British and the American requirements. And again, I came along in all innocence to do the 336. The rest of the aeroplane was conventional. It flew like a bird. It was great. But when we came to the stalls, to my absolute astonishment, it started to pitch up and I had to push to stop it. Not madly, but 10 or 12 pounds of stick force. And when I got down, I said, look, you've done it again. You were not supposed to have that quality. And I said, why does it happen? And they said, well, it happens because of this uh, increased lift right inboard, you see. And on a swept wing aeroplane, if you produce lift forwards, the machine will pitch up. 
which is exactly what he did. And I took a deep breath and I said, look, we're in trouble again now. And I said, I'm always the fall guy. You guys build these aeroplanes and you certificate them. You bully the FAA into certificating them. I come along and I turn them down and I'm always in odium in North America. So I got hold of Dick Sliff, who was the FAA test pilot. And I said, look, Dick, you've done it again too. Why the hell did you agree to this? And he said, oh, he said, we cleared it on equivalent level of safety. Now, it's like a dog's hind leg requirement. In all requirements, you'll find a dog's hind leg which says, you don't have to meet the exact wording of this requirement if you can show equivalent level of safety in some other fashion. You have to say that, you see, because every now and again something strange happens and you find that a machine is somehow acceptable in spite of the fact it doesn't meet the written word of a particular requirement. So Dick thought he was on good grounds. He said, equivalent level of safety. And I said, well, go on then. He said, what do you mean go on? I said, well, put some meat on it. What, what do you mean by equivalent level of safety? Where is the equivalence in that? And of course he was lost. He had no equivalence. The truth is that the aeroplane pitched up at the store. Now, the other thing which I couldn't deny is that the subsequent stall was perfectly safe. It pitched straight nose down and it was no sweat. On the other hand, no aeroplane should be allowed to pitch up into the stall. The military requirements, even the military requirements didn't accept that. The FAR written requirement said the aeroplane must be longitudinally stable right up to the stall and it wasn't. So again, I had to tell Boeing, the machine, it was not on, they had to fix it. I came home, big row again, BOAC upset, my boss upset. I had a different boss then, we had Roxby Cox by this time, and it led to a big row. Now Boeing had a fix, which we'll come to in a second, but before we come to the fix, Boeing chose to send all their top men over, and they came over to the UK, there was a big, big meeting, big row, and in the end, even my own boss deserted me, Hardigan. He said, look, Dave, you can't turn it down if the final stall is satisfactory and safe. I said, yes, I can, because you are compromising a, a fundamental level of a, a principle of stability in the requirements. And he said, well, you'll have to argue with the council. And of course, there were very important and powerful people on the council from Roxby Cox downward. So when it came to this meeting, which I will never forget, the meeting started, Hardingham said, I'll make an introduction. Well, he was terribly unfair, because in his introduction he destroyed my case before I made it, which was a bit unfair. In fact, when you think of it, it was dreadful. And while I was sitting there quietly fuming, I had to rebuild my case in my mind, because like in about two or three minutes I would have to start to speak myself, which and I managed to do it. I had it all mentally prepared. So when Hardingham finished, Roxby Cox looked at me and he said, well, Davis, tell us your side of it. So I took a deep breath and went in with both feet. I said, look, let me admit from the beginning that the subsequent stall on this aeroplane is perfect. But the machine pitches up into the stall, it doesn't meet the requirements, and it's not on. Because if a pilot neglects this aeroplane at low speed, it'll stall itself. If it's not on autopilot, and the machine is not normally on autopilot in the circuit. I said, not only that, think of what will happen if you give in on this. I said... Imagine all the requirements for stability, control, stalling, ability to trim. Say they are all peak out at 100. If you give in 10% on this, then stalling comes down to 90. Now, if you're willing to give away 10% on stalling, why don't you give away 10% on, uh, on uh, stability? I mean, why don't you give away 10% on ability to trim and stability and everything else? I said, and if you do that, you will end up with an aeroplane which is significantly less airworthy than it was before. Not only that, if you create this precedent now in whenever, 1960-something, the next time it comes up when a constructor is in trouble, you'll give away again. And I said, 20 years from now, you'll have a much lower standard of airworthiness than we have now. And I said, that is not your declared aim. I said, you guys, every now and again, when you want to make a big effect on the public, in public, you stand up and you say, continuing and worthless and safety is our, is our major goal. I said, you simply cannot accept this aeroplane. I said, not only that, but 
and it shouldn't really influence you, but you might as well know, I said, the fix is a piece of cake. I said, in comparative terms, it costs about top and sapony. It's called a stick nudger. Because you know when you storm these big aeroplanes, they don't have much buffet, and you get an artificial stick shake at about 1.08 VS. Now, when that, because Boeing told me this, they had a fix ready, see, because they're not daft. And when they knew they would have to fix it, they arranged this little stick nudger to sound off immediately the, the stick shake started and it wound up a little spring when I say in comparative terms tap and save me you could have bought the bits in Woolworths it winds up a little spring and it puts a little gentle push force into the control column and it takes out the pitch up and does the whole thing properly and that little device in fact changed the pitch up to a pitch down it did yes that's all it did you could you could set the aeroplane up to do a stall and instead of pitching up it would pitch down and recover so Roxby Cox looked round at all these powerful people and he said I am quite impressed with Davis's argument and he said now who who objects to our turning the aeroplane down and no one objected they all sat there and he said well that's it gentlemen he said the aeroplane is not acceptable so they turned it down the meeting finished I went out Hardingham sent for me he said you didn't half go at that I said look boss you were a bit unfair I said, you shot my case to pieces before I even opened my mouth. He didn't know what to say. He then left the room, and he looked at Walter Ty. He said, you'll have to ring BOAC in town. So he rang Charles Abel, who incidentally was the chief engineer. He wasn't a, a flight chap, and Abel was furious. And Abel told me years later, he said, it was unfair of you to snag that airplane. He said, we could have operated it. I said, look, Charles, with all respect, you were chief engineer. You were nothing to do with the pilots. I said, you have no right to make that statement. I said, even I wouldn't dare make a statement like that on behalf of pilots. What I, what I don't understand was that if the fix was so simple, yes. why did Boeing risk all this confrontation? Why just, to, you know, why, why couldn't they just go ahead and well, I, I tell you one, you complain? I'll tell you one reason. There is a law in the States which I think is called product liability, is it not? Yeah. Which means that if you admit your aeroplane is at fault, and someone gets killed as a result of it, you're in deep trouble because you were sued for millions and millions of dollars. Boeing would never willingly admit their aeroplanes were wrong and had to be improved. When in the end, of course, they had to, they had to. And in the case of the original 436, this new fin and rudder and, and um, boosted rudder and all this jazz, they were fitted to all 707s worldwide for nothing. And there's no, op there's no constructor in the world would, who would do that if they didn't have to do it. So when we finished with the 336, which was the last development of the big Boeings, we were then home and dry. We had the aeroplanes all certificated in a proper fashion. Now following that, there were two more, what you might call little 707s. There was the 138B, which was a Qantas aeroplane, and it was a 100 series 707, a little one. I mean, still big, but little in, in comparison with the 300 series. And it even had a shorter body. Qantas said to Boeing, we don't want a long-bodied aeroplane, we want a short-bodied aeroplane. So they finished up with a little titch, in comparative terms, of a 7 0 720B, wasn't it? it? No, it was a 138B. Oh, 138B. But the 720 was very similar. I, I'll come to that one in a minute. So I went out to Sydney to do a program on the 138B because Qantas was selling it to some British company who I've forgotten, but the aeroplane finished up with Freddie Laker. And uh, there was nothing wrong with that aeroplane. It was a conventional, ordinary 7.0, except it was a very small and very light aeroplane. I mean, its maximum weight was 235,000 pounds, as opposed to 336 for the big Boeings, yet it had the same engines. It went like the clappers. It was stuffed with performance. You could do a takeoff that wouldn't have disgraced a fighter. Now, for once in my life, and it was only once in test flying I made a mistake. It didn't hurt too much, but it, was, it, was a, it wasn't a good show. I was looking at the very high speed end of the envelope. We'd been up to MDF, which is 95 True Mark number, at high yeah, altitude. MDF. A maximum flight diving Mark number. Mm -hmm. It's not quite supersonic, it's 0.95. And the aeroplane flew quite well at 95 on all these things. And as you come down, if you plot MDF and speed against altitude, 
you find a limit at about 21,000 feet where the two limits coincide. You're up to your maximum Mach number and you're up to your maximum airspeed, which is about 406 knots or something. Now, because I've been flying to a maximum Mach limit all the way down this boundary and doing roll rates and things, when I got down to 21,000, I simply forgot that I should now be observing airspeed limit instead of mark limit. So I stuck with the mark limit and I came down to about 17,000 feet and I was still flying at 95 mark number. Now if you figure that out, that's about 440 knots. And suddenly somebody said, oh, I said, what's the matter? And somebody said, we haven't got any, uh, we haven't got any more airspeed. They said, I know what we've done. We've lost the cone because we used to trail a trailing cone, you see, to give us a true static. And then I realized what I'd done, so I quietly throttled back. And, but I'm not, I'm not shy. I had a marvelous Boeing test pilot in the right seat. I said, can you see the airspeed? And he said, oh, Christ, he said, how would you get that? I said, I'll tell you in a minute. So I throttled back, and we quietly pulled it up until we got back above 21. Now, that was the boo-boo, you see. I was fixated, the um, psychologist would call it, on Mach number. And I came down sufficiently low to exceed the limit airspeed of the aeroplane. It didn't hurt the aeroplane. I mean, we were doing 40 or 50 knots faster than any Boeing had ever been before. But there's no harm, it would appear, in a simple exceedance of limit airspeed. I mean, the windscreen won't blow in mm. and you won't tear the wings off. But it's still, it, it, a bit of a bad show. And I got a reputation with Boeing then of having set a world speed record, see, on seven knots. What about the Q-field? I mean, didn't that give you a clue? When you came no, out? it didn't, no. Because the machine was in trim. Yeah. It, and of course, with this amount of power, mm. it would have gone another hundred knots faster. God, it was moving. Now, the last 7.0, I, I don't need any of this anymore, mm. was the 720, which was a Northwest Airline aeroplane at Minneapolis St. Paul. Do you remember that film, Airport? Mm. Do you remember it? With all that blowing snow. Well, I did a flight program at Minneapolis St. Paul, which is where that film was made, in exactly similar conditions. Uh, high winds, blowing snow, oh, as cold as hell. Now, the 720 is very similar to a 138B. It flew beautifully. It was a very light and very small 70, but stuffed with power. The thing that sticks, and now I had Paul Soderlin in the right-hand seat. He was a great guy. He was the guy who sorted out, do you remember all the early jet upset problems, where pilots were coming downhill and pulling the wings off and doing all these stupid things? He did a lot of good work in looking after drills for runaway stabilizers, high-speed handling and everything else, all of which is in that book. And I was left on this aeroplane at 1,000 feet doing what we call VMCL, which is the minimum control speed in the landing configuration. Now, you've got to be very light to do this test because you've got to get very slow without stalling. And I was doing a one-engine-out case, which meant that number four was throttled to idle, and I was using these. But there was so much power in the aeroplane that every time I opened up to make the machine limiting, we were climbing like the clappers. Now, when you climb a jet engine aeroplane, you lose a lot of power because jet engines are virtually unsupercharged. They, they behave just like an unsupercharged piston engine with altitude. You get less and less thrust as you go higher. So the only way I could do it was to throttle back number two and three to keep the aeroplane symmetrical and then use number one only. And in the end, we discovered that I was doing this work at 1,000 feet with number four shut down, number two and three at idle, and only one engine left, which I was using to prove the ability to control the aeroplane, which we did. And even then, it was slowly climbing with the gear down and a bit of flap on. So there we were in a four-engine 707, gear down, a bit of flap, three engines at idle, one engine at full power, and we were climbing up. It was a fantastic demonstration. I mean, it, we didn't intend to do it. It was a byproduct of the test. But it showed simply how much power there was available in these small 7.0s. Now, having said that, that is the, the whole story of the UK certification of the original Boeing, the big one, and the other one, which had this pitch-up problem, and then the two little ones. I did a lot of work on 7 hours.